Up next is someone who loves to play and is delighted by the idea of combining art and engineering. She has created award-winning, large-scale interactive public sculptures that encourage community interaction and play. Her sculptures underscore the ripple effects that everyone has on their community and habitat, the energy of human connection, and the power of collective action, which I think is something we all need to talk more about now. Everyone, please welcome Brooklyn-based creator, Jen Lewin. Hi, and thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm talking uh, today from my studio in Brooklyn uh, in real life, and I'm going to be spending the, the next 30 minutes or so sort of looking back and reflecting on um, both the history of my work, but also on some of the really interesting um, challenges, uh, issues, but also successes that evolved over the last three years of creating large interactive public work during um, a global pandemic. So thought I would uh, kick off with a first slide and I will share my screen. So starting off uh, with sort of this image and this uh, image is actually from an OG piece um, from 2008, but I think this picture really depicts sort of what I love about the work that I do and really encapsulates my goal. You're looking at a large interactive public outdoor sculpture. And while you're looking at this illuminated light sculpture, to me, the most important thing that you're seeing is really this amazing connected experience amongst a community. People coming together, people gathering, and people people connecting in the artwork. And really underneath all of the work I make is this desire and this goal. And one of the questions um, I always get is, how did I get here? And uh, how did I start making work like this? So before I kind of kick into the last couple of years, I'm actually going to go through sort of a brief history of my process and how I work. It all started in 1983 uh, when I was in third grade and I got to be part of an experimental program to learn to code. And this was a program called Logo designed by Hal Abelson out of MIT. And this is really the grandfather, great grandfather of the language um, you have may have heard of now called Scratch. And I moved a small turtle around a screen and I built graphics. And this was on an old, very old Mac. Um, and for me, what I, the project I actually made in third grade was to draw the sol draw a solar system using simple geometry and code. But for me, this was sort of an aha moment. And I saw this device, this really big, bulky computer at the time as being a profound tool for making art. As I sort of moved through in my life, I became infatuated with both traditional mediums of art, painting, uh, crafting, kind of anything I get my hands on, drawing, sketching, but also electronics, um, architecture, mechanical engineering, kind of anything that really was both in the sciences, both the art. And I think this project, which is an early work from kind of 1999, 2000s, depicts that sort of mashup of ideas. You're looking at silk that I hand painted. Um, I actually built this piece in my kitchen um, and I was batiking silk and as I was doing it the silk kind of felt like it looked like a circuit board to me so I started weaving electronics into the work creating my own circuit this PCB that you're seeing in the cor corner of the circuit was uh, pretty crude now when I look back on it uh, but creating a large robotic butterfly I could actually dance with um, and this moved this piece you could move with it and you could dance with it so sort of this mashup of all of these ideas also started making laser harps really early on. This is um, a harp from almost 25 years ago. And you might say, what's laser harp? A lot of people know, but some people don't. So let's listen to a second of what a laser harp is. Yeah, I did not. Do we have to start over? Yikes, sorry. There we go. Okay, back quick. Let's try again. Let's try that. Ah, well, there we go. I too. 
How about that? That's <laughs> a success. Um, by moving your hand through each of the 60 light beams, you mix different sounds. For example, each beam can trigger up to 12 different sounds based on how you're moving. Slow movements create rhythmic pulses and whispering echoes. Fast movements create sharp notes and more jagged sounds. Work also started to really explore the idea of bringing people into the work, this idea of participation. Um, this is a, also a very early work, but it's quite literally exploring that. It's a moth that you could set to flight. There was a piece on the ground that you would touch and it would sense capacitance and then it would set this big ethereal moth above you into motion. Um, I'm playing with the idea of light, but also bringing people into the work where the work really only happens if you're in it, but also you being in it is part of the work. So sort of exploring the idea of um, visitor and viewer as also actor and participant in the sculpture. Early on, I mentioned these works were all made in my kitchen or you know, later into a very, very small studio space is the size of a single table. And the wiring looked like this, all of this built by me, really um, hacking um, parts, playing with, you know, not just materials, but electronics and creating these kind of early rat's nest pieces. Another thing evolved early on, which I didn't expect, um, but was this sort of outsourcing material around the world. Um, this is a piece um, about 15 years old where I wanted to create these large interactive works out of glass, traditional glass bulbs. And I needed to find someone who would make glass bulbs, but without the filament. And I searched all over the US, searched all through Europe and ended up having to go to India to work with a company that had converted to using CFL lights, but actually had the original molds for glass bulbs and started making glass bulbs. And I started making these glass sculptures and this is, um, an earlier work, you'll see some of this work showing up. You can actually see some of these glass bulbs actually behind me as I'm speaking. But an example of really starting to sort of come in. sort of you know had to dive into the i you know the realm of public outdoor art this was a very early piece done in uh, 2010 with the uh, artist lawrence argent large outdoor public sculpture you're looking at it here on the ground built all the fiberglass and led systems with a team uh, chrysler and associates in palo alto i'm sorry in california um and really had to work on what it meant to make sort of a piece that was going to sit outside this is a work in Vail, Colorado, video from over 10 years ago. Um, and like all of my work, I started to develop a language and system for controlling lighting. One of the things that's interesting about these sculptures is there's no big computer nearby. Each one of these components, each one of the lights is smart on its own and uh, communicates wirelessly and communicates over a language and a protocol that I started to play with that actually showed up as really the language that I use as the medium in my work even to this day. As the works got more and more sophisticated, here we're looking at a more sophisticated laser harp, my electronics had to get more sophisticated. And again, I had to look to do this globally. I started actually creating my own laser sensors to build all of the laser harps. Um, this is a sensor that uh, was built. I actually work with the same company out of South Africa to make these really highly specialized laser sensors that can be used in all climates, outdoors, are fast enough for responsive sound and allow me to sort of create my work. So this like strong engineering process that started to move globally to make sculptures of this nature. And then really having to adapt those pieces such that they could exist in public and outdoors. This is a piece installed seven years ago in Minneapolis for Be The Match. And this is an outdoor laser, the laser harp. This piece has been so challenging because Minnesota has very hot conditions and very cold conditions. The piece was smashed into by a snow plow. Um, it's had to be rebuilt several times, um, but still has been very successful and is still um, in Minnesota. We can listen to a few moments of this piece. Because of the highly public and interactive nature of the work also was really sort of uh, forced to think about accessibility and what it meant to make work that could be used and played with by all. Some of the most exciting projects I've done along those reins are for a really wonderful foundation in California called the Magical Bridge Foundation and they make 
incredibly accessible playgrounds for all abilities. And this is one of my magical workshops. Um, I've got uh, several of these all over spread through California. And these are laser harps that allow you to play and move and dance um, during the day and basically create collaborative music with your body. And coming back to that original slide, um, not just sourcing components from all over, but moving sculptures all over, um, we started getting requests for this piece, the pool, to move around the world. It's been, I think, to you know, hundreds of exhibitions, um, and just, I mean, it's moved globally. I actually have someone full time on my team who just sort of manages the movement of these big sculptures um, from environments like Burning Man. It's been to Burning Man uh, many times but also just all different kinds of climates, places, uh, groundscapes, um, just really consistently traveling and um, providing my team with this really wonderful experience of watching a play sculpture throughout the world. Also, obviously, having to uh, learn about climate, you know, what happens in the sculptures in the snow. Interestingly enough, for us, snow, the challenge or the challenge of snow hasn't been um, the moisture of snow, it's been the slipperiness of snow. So we've actually had to learn a lot about what it means to make an ADA compliant anti-slip surface that can, um, you know, be walked on by thousands of people, but still not be slippery. So really interesting challenge and a lot of learning along those lines. Um, building our own, own electronics that, you know, can be durable. Here we're smashing LEDs and making sure that this LED ring will still work. Here we're freezing it, heating things up. Also, you know, really thinking about what it means to be part of creating a work that has this element of community engagement and creating educational programs. In this picture, I'm in Hong Kong actually working with children to teach them how to program using this sculpture as um, an example of that and using some of our tools and some of our mediums and some of our systems that we'd created in-house. Lots of apps. This is an app uh, created actually by my husband uh, for Google I.O., which is an Android app, which allows you to draw on the sculpture in real person, in real to, uh, in person. Um, and then, you know, evolving into even bigger pieces. This is a piece from 2017. One of the fun things about this video is that this piece was so large we couldn't um, actually ever see it laid out. We had to build everything in small pieces in my Brooklyn studio. And this day of this drone footage um, taken by the very talented Matt Emmy was actually shot the very first time the team and I saw this piece laid out. And in fact, when I look at it, all I see are problems. I see all the out platforms that needed to be fixed and I need software that needed to be updated um, but very interesting <laughs> to sort of have spent a year building a sculpture and then sort of watch it um, for the first time from a drone. This is actually that very night. So if you want to talk about user testing, uh, I would say this is kind of an ultimate user testing moment um, here with the Mayan warrior art car pulling up and um, hundreds of people on the work. Of course, that work has also traveled, so learning how to travel with the work, lots of challenges around it. We had one climate where we had to deal with really terrible static issues um, and trying to rebuild the sculpture at the last minute to mitigate static. And then, um, you know, moving these pieces into permanent pieces, um, I'm not sharing a lot of work that we had done, but Basically, we also have created a lot of permanent work. So what does it mean to take a temporary work and then have it be permanent? Um, this is an example of a piece that was installed in Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, that's a permanent glass sculpture on the ground, which sort of brings us to, um, you know, January of 2020. <laughs> In January of 2020, I sat down with my team. Uh, we actually toasted some mezcal and uh, talked about how awesome the year was gonna be. It was gonna be the best year ever. We were building the biggest sculpture I'd ever built called Cosmos, and it was going to be installing in Tokyo. 
And then we were going to move that piece to Burning Man. We had a three-story Aurora Borealis we were creating for the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. And it was really just looking like it was going to be one of the most epic years of all time. In fact, it was we were so excited about it. We uh, filmed this own uh, footage of us in, you know, in the studio prepping. I think this was February. Um, and we're meeting because we want to get ready to go to Tokyo, uh, looking at plans, sort of great moment of my studio. Uh, it actually looks a little bit like that today, right now as well. And even so excited that we filmed this car crates, crates heading out the door, heading to Tokyo. Uh, you got crate 28. Um, I think there were 15 crates that went out there. Um, the crate 28 is heading to um, Japan team in Japan, so excited, moving through all the subways, excited to be doing this install. Um, and then leading to installing the work. Um, and as it's happening, we're starting to sort of get worried. It looks like there's signs that this is going to be a real pandemic. We continue working, interestingly. Um, this is a fun video because I'm actually programming the sculpture by walking on it. The sculpture gets laid out and then I can wirelessly go through it and identify addresses for all of the platforms. So I mentioned there's no master computer, so all of these platforms are communicating with themselves wirelessly and I'm actually giving them their addresses. And you can see Charlie Lindgren from my team uh, dance testing the work and making sure that those addresses that I laid out are correct. Um, you know, everyone on my team uh, has to do quite a bit of dance testing. That's something that's continually part of the sculpture. It was on this night, however, that we determined it was probably um, the right choice for me to send my team back. I was worried. We were starting to get news of all the pileups in Newark. We were worried the U.S. was going to completely close its borders. We were worried we wouldn't be able to leave Tokyo. Um, and I made the decision to sort of finish the sculpture as much as possible, but we would close, we would reopen the sculpture in three months, and I would come back and finish all of the code um, and tuning and programming. And that seems like, of course, we would be able to come back in three weeks three months. Got everyone on a plane and this is our international flight uh, from Tokyo to New York uh, as it was when it took off. So no one on there uh, alone on the flight and of course um, like everyone else in New York landed gave my team hugs thinking I would see him soon after and we all went into you know shelter in place for three three months in our case. Um, Shells in place was interesting for us though, um, while there was so much concern about health and safety for everyone, we were actually able to sort of spend some time, this is me uh, coding and creating part of a new piece uh, on my bed. Um, well, one of the interesting things about this time is it gave us this interesting bandwidth to sort of work on some things we wouldn't typically have worked on. The first thing we did, which was extremely lucky, was to order and sort of re-up all of the supplies we needed for the next year and a half of work. Um, designed a bunch of components, um, even though so much of China was shut down, we were able to sort of get them into the sort of schedule to get into production and sort of spent a bunch of time doing housekeeping that really helped us operate um, when we re reopened up. And then the other thing was to revisit some old projects and some old um, pieces I had really wanted to work on, one of which I'm gonna show you at the end of this, that's called The Last Ocean. So having the time and mental bandwidth to sort of step back and really think about some of the pieces maybe that had been forgotten, but also to do some housekeeping to figure out some of the things we needed for the future. While I was there, however, Tokyo uh, decided to open and it was a bummer for me because I was not able to go back and finish all of the programming and the tuning, but the sculpture did open. Um, we got this drone video, uh, video of it. Um, I of course see problems I would have fixed and changed and um, I probably will never leave a sculpture without completely finishing it again with the assumption I'll come back. Um, I will make sure everything is done, but it was actually a really successful installation that um, the community there felt like they could have outdoors in a way that was safe and allow the public to sort of play and have this great moment during a time when everyone was otherwise locked down. 
And then our permanent work, which most of which was outdoors in plazas, also started reaching out to us. What they were finding, for example, in Vail was that their summer was quite busy. Everyone wanted to go outdoors and they had this bandwidth and they wanted to know if we would come and start refurbishing, for example, the water tree, which at that point was 12 years old and really needed to have an LED update. And so my team and I sort of reevaluated and found ways to kind of go to these sites and work outdoors. We found ourselves in Vail, um, up in the tree, um, working in harnesses for two full weeks. Um, it's a really fabulous map over here of all of our work. Um, to rebuild the tree and uh, the new tree of course has pixel controlled LEDs because things have updated and these are videos uh, taken of the tree. Uh, the tree is not yet complete because the fiberglass work all needs to be done this summer. Of course the work there really needs to happen during the summer months but um, this was all sort of you know a year and a half year ago um, updating this work. And then some of our outdoor exhibitions also decided to um, still continue. We had an outdoor exhibition in um, Oklahoma City and this went on. I, I had to actually do this work with my team remotely installing it over Zoom, which was very stressful and very frustrating, but we figured out you know, how to do this. And there were a lot of challenges with dealing with doing a remote install of this size. But one of the most amazing, I think, um, things that came out of this exhibition, um, which is one of my favorite things of the last few years, was this incredible dance performance by the Race Dance Collective, where they came and actually performed and wrote a poem and series of uh, musical moments, as well as a, a piece of choreography on the piece. And we're just going to watch a little bit of that. no choice but to reflect you as I walk amongst your curves and your grid lines let us expand we are shifting through this mobius terrain choice by choice whether with or against tide let us expand and at that point, my team and I also felt like, well, if this can happen in Tokyo and happen in Oklahoma, we have some extra pieces here um, from the original Tokyo exhibition. Let's do this in New York. And so we worked with Domino Park and um, did a great successful exhibition um, work that would otherwise have sat in storage, which created this great community moment where everyone could come out and be together during this time when a lot of New York still really felt um, felt like there, you know, we were all really mainly still working at home. Also got the great opportunity to travel to Hawaii, had to wait till the very moment that they opened um, to install a very fun piece at the Iolani School, an interactive sculpture um, that the school there has actually been using as a teaching platform as well to teach music and dance and math. Um, fun video of all the kids and you can see, you know, everyone's in face masks and face shields. Um, and this is a work called Flow. And continuing to prototype at the studio, um, we did have a large piece going to the Minneapolis airport and they too actually requested that we still install it. Um, we needed to figure out a way to work within the airport safely. These are videos of a prototype of the piece. Um, it's, you'll see it in a bit, but it was a, intended to be a large aurora borealis that captures movement. And this is a case where I am using kind of more refined, a larger computer to drive the work. Um, all of the software built in house using depth mapping uh, cameras and I'm sort of capturing and moving and it's creating this aurora effect based on my movement. Uh, going to the airport, working in the airport, this is the aluminum frame for that structure that's being hung, 20,000 aluminum rings uh, welded into this form that was actually quite light because it was aluminum, about 700 pounds, and we're lifting it into the airport. My team then came back and we spent um, almost four weeks um, 
installing the work, uh, you'll see again these glass bulbs that I have mentioned um, coming from India, same software um, that we're sort of building, all custom components. And these are some of the components that we had sort of designed and sourced while we were um, at home during those three months of sort of stricter shelter in place. And the end result for this work uh, is a uh, interactive aurora borealis through the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport in Terminal 1. All of the graphics and color and light that flows up the work are based on human movement below. And there are um, eight lake forms derived from public lake clusters in the region um, that you can dance on that twirl light below you. One of the cool things about this work is that all of the colors and palettes and um, even though the graphics are derived from human motion and interaction, all of the colors pull from live weather data. So if it's snowing, there's actually snow palettes. If it's raining, there are rain palettes. All of the colors sort of pull from the heat and the temperature outside and create these sort of diverse connected color ranges that not only tie sort of the people's motions and activity within the airport, but also tie that to sort of the outside space and the outside environment in uh, Minnesota. Which brings us to uh, most recently and the most recent project. Um, I had shown a map of kind of our work around the world, but um, this is our supplier map and it's really all of the suppliers we work with constantly on an active basis. And after we had sort of gotten through all the planning, early planning and all the parts that we had um, been able to source, we then sort of landed in the last couple months with this problem of, you know, as everyone is saying over and over again, supply chain, but for us, this has been really very real. Um, and it has created a story where it's extremely difficult for us to sort of make any of these parts and had to been very creative about it. I actually redesigned all of our internal um, electronic systems to create, this is an example of, the, of a board that um, will be actually deployed into almost all of our work. Every work will have something like this, but had to kind of rethink all of the design and rethink it based on what was available. Um, and my own art process shifted from conceptualizing artwork to looking at spreadsheets like this. This is a spreadsheet um, that I spend a lot of time in. Uh, which is sourcing components. And I think it's really interesting when you look at where all of these components are coming from. Um, I've got this list over here, you know, it's it's you know, France, US, Japan, China, Switzerland, um, Germany, Taiwan, uh, really from all over. And so trying to sort of get all of these things together and bring them together to create um, new work. Uh, so new work. Um, I had mentioned that during that time of shelter in place, we revisited old projects and I had had an imagined a project um, quite a long time ago called The Last Ocean. And The Last Ocean was inspired by a book called The Last Ocean of beautiful photographies to, uh, uh, photographs taken from Antarctica. And I had wanted to make this piece. I had envisioned a large interactive ice field, but I did not want to make it unless I could build it in a way that I felt was um, sort of worldwide responsible, um, which included being able to create it in a way where we used really, um, really smart uh, and resourceful resources. Part of that required, or I, I added as a requirement, the idea that the entire piece be created from re uh, either recycled or reclaimed plastic since we were using a lot of plastic. So that started this process uh, that took almost a year and a half of research with my team looking around the world to try and find interesting ways that we could fabricate out of fully recycled plastic. Um, US manufacturers that we had worked with and we work with a lot of plastic manufacturers would do, we are able to do percentages or small amounts, but no one would truly manufacture at scale for us out of all recycled plastic. And then I also wanted it all to be ocean uh, bound or ocean claimed plastic that we had pulled out of the ocean. We finally found a group called Ocean Plastic Technologies in uh, South Africa, and we'll watch a, just a very short video um, from them um, about their work. So I actually flew to South Africa with uh, Mikhail Flores Amper from my team. Uh, this is a bunch of the plastic that was collected. This has all been um, being collected from their beaches, from the water or from ocean bound rivers um, and then sorting it 
wanting to really use all of it, figuring out methodologies and ways to actually form it. This is Ocean Plastic Technologies and myself, and we're doing experiments to create panels um, out of 100% of this reclaimed plastic. Quite a lot of like research here. This is uh, Mickey from my team. We have been working with a really cool company that makes a uh, reclaimed fiberglass product and using um, really innovative resin technology and creating these base forms and we'll talk about the shape in a minute. Um, all of these videos are just from a few um, weeks ago. Uh, I'm doing LED tests and of course, um, you know, working with South Africa, lots and lots of Zoom calls, lots of Zoom videos in this video. Uh, Mickey and I are chatting with the team there and you're actually seeing some of the starts of these platforms on the ground. The math for these platforms, and just a quick minute about these, the math for these platforms is uh, created by very inspirational woman, Marjorie Rice, who um, single-handedly actually invent, uh, well, discovered several pan uh, pentagonal tilings. And we're using her type nine tiling. If you ever want a really cool story about math, I highly recommend looking her up, Marjorie Rice. Uh, there's only 15 known pentagonal tilings in the known universe, um, uh, many in, you know, recently discovered by AIs, but she actually invented from her kitchen table a huge cluster of them. We're using this plus a plastic, uh, pla recycled plastic to create our new work, The Last Ocean, and we'll see if just a few seconds of that. This work will uh, actually, will be demoing it, showing it in New York this summer, but it will premiere at Burning Man. And here you can see Marjorie Rice's nested patterns, um, and it will be, you know, really an entirely large, interactive, 8,000 square foot piece uh, created from reclaimed plastic trash. And then I've got two little slides just to talk about sort of the world of, you know, the world of working and creating art. This from this morning, this is uh, actually coming in from South Africa flooding. So building this project and the hurdles of this project and now working with the team that has had the factory flooded and, um, you know, we've got half the platform sitting in this flooding right now. Another series of platforms are sitting actually in pallets in Lux Luxembourg trying to get to us. So kind of going back to this sort of, um, you know, the challenges of making these kinds of pieces globally right now. And then sort of the final slide of the last ocean, um, which, you know, we, <laughs> this will be, when we get it here and we can get it installed, we'll be very, very excited to, uh, to take out into the world again. And that's the end. That's amazing. Round of applause. This was so cool to look at all of the different installations. I just, I couldn't help but think like, I can't imagine anybody being sad interacting with your work. Like there's no way to feel sad playing in that little space. Like it really brings out this joyful energy. Um, do you design from that emotion to begin with? Or is that something that comes up in the, you know, the nature of the work? Um, it's funny, the work, it always has that and it always, ha yes, the, the work is always fun. I mean, I was just in San Francisco last week. Uh, we had installed a piece and there's these videos of me running around just like laughing and giggling as I run around under the work. Um, it's, it has at its heart that idea of joy um, and play and like that kind of human quality that I think we all miss from our lives. I miss it as well. Um, often in the process of making the work for me is one of just worry, worry and planning, worry, planning, engineering, and like concern. Um, and then there's this final sort of installation that can be just quite lovely. So after all these years of concern and worry and pushing and um, challenges and hurdles to then have that moment of being able to play in the work is quite special. So I, I mean, that, that's gonna keep me coming back and doing this forever. That's amazing. Um, I really want to ask you about your problem solving process, because there must be so many factors to consider when you're creating something, particularly something that's sitting outside and can experience so much disruption. We saw a little bit of that as you were testing um, earlier on. 
Uh, and then, of course, the bigger disruptions like things like pandemics. Um, so what is part of your, your process? How do you think about the problems that might occur and then solving for them? The problem solving is one of the critical, um, I mean, it's a critical part of the whole team and it's like a day-to-day -day activity. We have so many team meetings that are just these critical problem solving brainstorming sessions. Um, we have these spreadsheets called lessons learned, which are just like go back over 15 years of how many things that we've learned over time. How do we document those things? How do we remember those things forward? And then when we're having these kind of moments of critical problem solving um, charrettes almost, they're almost like design discussions like let's sit down here's the problem how do we work this out we also have to keep in mind the history of the things that were learned and then we need to take the that forward too so for me it's really this kind of really circular um process of learning remembering the learning <laughs> and then bringing that into uh, problem solving discussions that require collaboration. I mean, it requires kind of getting different minds to think together, getting people with different experience together and really thinking about things critically. So it becomes kind of a collaborative um, process. I love that. Um, I never thought to document my problems because you're right, you're probably experiencing a lot of the same things over and over again. And just having that resource there is super valuable as a designer. That's great. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to some of the questions that the audience is asking here. Um, so building installations art is the art part, but then there's the venue part. So getting your first venue pieces, did you do them as commissions or did you first uh, find a place and then build it, or did the place come later? Uh, in the very early day, I built the pieces. They were kind of hobby pieces. So I was building the piece based mm -hmm. on the piece and then finding the venue. Um, later that changed when, when we go through the process of like formal public art pieces. Um, you know, for example, this coming year coming up, we're doing two big public art commissions um, for Cincinnati and for Arlington. And in those cases, we really, or I really start by looking at the site. So it's getting all the site drawings and really analyzing the site. In fact, my team is doing this right now for another project. And we had this long discussion about what, what's in the site. And so like looking at it in Google Maps, where are people moving through the site? It's almost an architectural process on that point. So how are people going to use the park, um, what's the flow, um, what are the high sizes of the buildings, and then really building a piece for that site specifically. So we've got a lot of technical questions, um, and I think some questions that seem to point to people wanting to potentially buy <laughs> your pieces or commission them. Um, so is the art um, software open source? Would you consider open sourcing it? Um, <laughs> the art software is built, you know, it's originally built by me and it's really, it's really been customized to be just for like the mm -hmm. process of my work. Um, so it would be, it'd be interesting to open source because it's so refined for what I'm trying to do. It really does nothing else. Like it really senses these interactions. Mm -hmm. It communicates the colors I want. It does all of the things I would ask for. Um, almost as if I've like created a paint palette specifically for the work itself. So I'd be open sourcing it is something I would definitely be open to doing. We definitely teach, like we often, I use that example, we've, we've taken it places and taught kids how to use it and we're showing them all the code. There's nothing super magical about any of it, um, but it is really highly specifically sort of customized down to my work and it doesn't really do much else. So it's really been adapted for that. So I'm not sure if it would be that, um, useful for someone else, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's amazingly useful for me, um, but I'm not sure how applicable, uh, applicable it would be for other things. I think we're all kind of wondering, how do I get one? Like, how do I get one in my room? <laughs> is there a way for me to work out this sort of process where this thing exists in my life? Um, I, I think you've kind of like sparked some imagination here. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, so I'm just going to find one. So is there any less glamorous work that you do? Um, is there a bread and butter type of work that gets done in the studio every day? They sort of keep the doors open between the installations or is it really the installations that you're focused on? Um, well, no, all of the work is the installations, um, but um, the 
the creation of these installations is not that glamorous, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I talk about some of these pieces and they move around the world and they're going somewhere kind of every month, but they get muddy and dirty and, you know, have gum on them and have to come back to our studio and we do flips. And so the studio is constantly doing a flip, which is basically us power washing a sculpture scrubbing it, mm. um, pulling mildew out of it, mold out of it, you know, building a crate. So there, there, and that, that's like consumes so much of the time and energy in our shop. So I would say that's not, you know, that's not glamorous art building. It's like art cleaning, <laughs> um, which we do a lot of in order to, you know, have this work move around the world. I love that. That's like literally dirty work, the dirty work that goes on behind the scenes that nobody sees. Yeah. And there's a lot of it that we all do. Yeah. <laughs> That's really great. Um, round of applause for Jen and her amazing work. This was so awesome to see. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us.